to Pet Care with Dr. O. I am very fortunate today to be speaking with Shorty as my guest, and we are going to be talking about a theory about a way to communicate with horses that I uh, didn't know. I've been riding horses. I'm a veterinarian. I've been a whole bunch of things. And I was trained the same way most people were trained, that in order to get a relationship with a horse, and I guess some domination or to figure out a relationship where I'm in control, it required a bit in the mouth, maybe spurs on my boots, and definitely shoes on their hooves. And I've recently discovered through my relationship with Shorty here that um, there's a better way and there's a different way and there's a kinder way to do this. So Shorty's agreed with the kindness in her heart to come talk to us about this today because it's um, it's amazing and it actually it it's a wonderful way to have a connection with our equine friends that is something beyond my understanding and my capability with my horse friends and now that i am older and hopefully wiser i'm going to listen to shorty and i hope you will too so welcome to sylvia global media network and holistic pet care with dr o i'm turning it over to shorty to help to inform enlighten all of us and then we will have shorty on again for another show and we're going to be talking about what at that show remedial equine and helping horses be the horses that they truly are with using methods um with the non-violent methods um through a lot of work with monty roberts and her relationship with monty so we have a lot of exciting stuff coming so uh welcome to holistic pet care with dr o as i've said before and shorty here is from the arizona equestrian connections facility here in arizona so i'm going to turn it over to her and um hopefully you guys will all be thrilled about iron free horsemanship and how it sends us on a completely different relational path with our equine friends just a moment here's shorty and listen shorty thank you so much for being here i appreciate it it's been crazy here you go well thank you very much and i'm very happy and joyous and glad to be here um I guess the, the main thing is that so many people uh, with their horse relationships, uh, they have been told through the years and through people that are the experts that, you know, you got to show them who's boss. You got to be the one. You got to make them do this. You got to get them to do that. They're supposed to do that. And who cares if they're, they'll get over it. They don't need to be worried about their afraid. And uh, the contrast to that is offering the horse the opportunity to actually uh, in seek an answer. So you're actually asking a question and you're allowing the horse to process the question. You're helping them with your cues, meaning your leg or pressure and release off of their head. Uh, because I don't use a bit, I say head because I use a Dr. Cook bitless bridle. There are several others out there that I think are probably just as effective, but I started with him 20 years ago and I have had it be very effective for me and I like it. So um, it's a matter of pressure and release, pressure and release. And horses in, throughout their life move with pressure and release. So if you watch a horse, if you watch a baby, it'll go over and start harassing one of the other horses. He'll put the pressure on the mare and the mare will usually walk away. They don't, the mare doesn't push back. The baby will keep pushing, but the mare will walk away. That's the release. And so when you're actually communicating with this horse is with a pressure release, you're actually asking by putting pressure, in this case, say, on their head through the bitless bridle, which applies the pressure at the pole, at the top of the head. And then if they respond by a tiny, tiny, and this is the key, the tiniest little try deserves a reward. And the reward, reward has to be instantaneous, and that is a release. And then you take it back and you start over again. Monty Roberts uses the, the phrase picnic. Positive instant consequences and negative instant consequences. The instant is the key. And the consequences are either applying the pressure and then applying more. That would be the negative. Or the positive would be releasing and then taking the pressure back and asking again. Once the horse understands that this is the key, is the release, then what happens is it goes so much faster. And the key is that most people... If they don't really understand the pressure technique, they will go from zero to 10. And if you go from zero to 10, then what have you got left? You're already there. So you want to do it in what Monty also calls incremental learning. 
Horses learn in incremental learning. So you would take your pressure at one and you would wait. Allow the horse to process it and they will look. You will watch them. If you're doing this, asking them to just tip their nose, which is an excellent pro process to get them to stand and to round their back so they can carry weight. If you will take that pressure at one and wait, they will stick their nose in the air. They will stick their nose to the right. They will stick their nose to the left. They're looking for an answer. And you have to just stay steady and not move. And there is a sweet spot, a sweet spot where it's soft and they have to find it. So if they don't find it on one, you might up to two, to three, to four, to five. And then you, you have to keep waiting, though, and allow them to go, huh, let's see, what do I do? And then say at six, they, go, they tip their nose like uh, make it an eighth of an inch, but you can feel it. You have to really be, it's called reaching for the feel. And so when you feel that, you release instantly. And then you take it back up again. Now, here's the key that people get confused on. They could take it up at six. You go back to one and you start over again. So there's a process for the horse to go, okay, let's see. I think I've got it. And then each time as you continue to do this, the horse will get softer and softer and more responsive so that the, you'll be at a point where you just barely touch the reins and the horse goes, I know what you want. But it's enabling them to ask a question and then you're going to help them with the answer. You've asked the question. I'm sorry. You've asked the question and now you're going to help them find the answer. And it's also the same thing with leg aids. When you put a leg on, Spurs are, uh, Monty Roberts uses spurs, but he has rubber tips for them. And they're not spiky, big, pointy, vicarious spurs. They're just little nubs. And the thing about a spur is what it is, is it's an extension of your leg. And on some of these very highly trained reining horses and performance horses, if you even move your eyelid, that horse goes, oh, you wanted me to go to the right. So if you're struggling to get your leg on the horse to ask them to do something because you don't have that little tip of a spur to touch them, it can set them off to do something you really didn't require. But having said that, for those of us that are your average horse people riding every day, enjoying just being with our horses, our horses aren't that highly defined or trained. So the spur is not an instrument that we need to use. Use, and especially if it's used in a violent way, which is to cause pain for the horse. And a lot of people say, well, okay, well, what about causing pain? Anything that causes any kind of pain is absolutely, violence is never the answer. Now you might say, well, okay, but what about yelling at my horse? Guess what? It's the same category. Um, when you are yelling at an animal or a person, your internal process is as elevated as if you were hitting them and the horse feeds on that they f experience that they are a prey animal you're a predator you have just kicked into predator mode and they're going boy i don't know if i want to be around this person anymore this does not feel right so you know you've got so many levels but the main thing is to remember that the horse is a prey animal you are a predator and they are wh what we want them to do is we want them to choose to be with us and by choosing to be with us, they have now decided that we're not your average kind of predator. We don't yell at them. We don't hit them. We don't kick them. We don't scare them. We don't put them in places where it would be fearful unless we help them overcome those fears. So they're starting to think, well, you know, this is really different. And this is how we become effective as horsemen or horsewomen is to ask the horse, set them up for success and then reward them by taking off the pressure. So that is a key factor in working with these horses. There's a great statement. It's when understanding runs out, violence steps in. And if you think about it, it's very valid because you, when we're talking with people, if we're trying to get a point across to someone and they're just going, I, you know, I don't, I don't really get your point. I really don't get your point. Usually the human gets more elevated. Well, okay, okay, okay. Let me explain it this way. And this is, takes a new level with, with what people do with horses. Then it becomes hitting or yelling or, or tying them up, tying their head around, doing things that absolutely teaches them nothing but fear and resistance. So that's the key. Um, what else would you uh, like me to bring out in that? Uh, Can you talk about how you use 
use these methods and move into the remedial program under the Tucker Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the remedial horses, um, they come with baggage. Um, and there is an old line that horses never forget, but they will forgive. And um, so the object is to find that what is that baggage and why is it, why are they in that place and if you can kind of get a clue it helps but the bottom line is that why someone or an animal does something is not really the point the point is to get them through it and i always think of the fact that say a human being is afraid of water and they don't know why they're afraid of water they just know they're afraid of water and they're at a family reunion and their uncle is there and he goes oh aren't you going swimming he goes no 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 you know i'm afraid of water and he goes oh that's right when you were three years old your aunt threw you in the water and you almost drowned now the person knows why but are they less afraid of water no so what has to happen is with these horses you have to prove that that fear they're carrying with them is no longer there the predator is not there there is someone that is gentle quiet and maintains a quietness within them because the quietness within them is what they feed off of they look to you for quiet movement quiet thought and keeping your energy at a lower level and so it's it's a process of training yourself as well as training the horse because the the horse will feed off of other horses and they will feed off of you Well, yeah, I mean, actually, the way I got into the remedial horses is I've often acquired horses that needed help, and um, I took them because nobody else wanted them or because they were probably going to go to the killer lot. And um, so that was a process over the years. But then when I started this program, um, I knew a gal in Apache Junction that has a rescue program, and I called her up and I said, I'd like to get some horses. And so she, I went out and looked at a couple and picked them, brought them home and started working with them. And then she brought me three more that she just picked. And um, so I took them into the program and I basically utilized the skills I learned with Monty, which was uh, what he calls join up, follow up, and then using the language of the horse, which is Equus. And this is something he learned by studying the Mustangs and watching how they move each other, how they respond to each other. And it's the predator-prey relationship and proving to them that you're not a prey animal. And so each one of these horses, I basically did a join up with. I also did a follow up with so that by the time I was done, I was walking around my arena with them just following me and doing obstacle courses, which would be part of their task when I had people working with them and then taking them to the next level, which would be the desensitizing program, which would be plastic bags on a stick, a tarp on the, the ground uh, that looks like a, a strip of water, um, umbrellas, uh, balloons. I mean, anything you can think of. And with the older horses, this uh, is a challenge because the older horses are not so willing to just like a, a two-year-old or a, 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 a yearling. They'll kind of go, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, and they'll go, oh, no big deal. Whereas as a 10-year-old is going to go, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. And so the introduction of this takes a lot longer, and you have to go back. You go back, and you, you'll you get them desensitized where they react or re respond rather than react, and you, you quit. And then the next day you come back and you start over again and the response is much quicker rather than the reaction. And it just takes a, a longer time. Some of these horses though, I have been able to bring into my program to use with people uh, that want to ride and want to do these obstacle course within a week. And that's something I never could do using the standard techniques that I use, which are gentle, but they're slower. And, the, and they're slower for the horse. It's actually a favor for me to do this for the horse because it speeds up their learning curve so that they feel comfortable doing this and they can move right into the horse they truly are. Uh, what's the difference between, you mentioned join up and then you mentioned follow up? Follow up. Yeah, join up is, is the first process and that's really where you are in the round pen with the horse and you send them away. And I mean, it's like, as Monty says, you want to go away, go away and go away really far. And you become very big, eyes on eyes, shoulders on shoulders of the horse. And you stay with them, driving them around the round pen. And as you do this, and you just 
throw a line at them. You're not hitting them or anything. You're just throwing the line out to keep them moving. And sometimes you don't even have to do that. And then they will, uh, the first thing that will happen is they'll bring an ear and an eye on you that says, hmm, I think I need to watch this person. Then they'll make a couple of more rounds, and the next thing you'll know, they'll be cutting the circle a little closer. So they're bringing the circle in. And then the next phase, and these are all almost like book. You can almost write a book, and, and, and I mean, and you can almost time it depending on the horse. And then you will see the next thing, the horse will start licking and chewing. And then the final thing is the horse will start to put its nose to the ground and drop its head. And at that point, there is a moment when you have that join up. And basically, if they're, say, going to your right, you're going to turn to your right and draw them in. And you're going to drop your shoulders, drop your eyes to the ground, and you're going to wait. And in a few minutes, you're going to have a horse in your pocket. And this can be a wild horse. It can be an untouched horse. It can be a horse that has issues. And then at that point, you will turn to them, and then you will start to rub them all over but not looking them in the eye and the sweet spot is is we call it is between their eyes on their forehead and you rub that and then you rub them on the neck and then you rub them on the shoulder and you have to do both sides because their brain is not connected what happens on the left side it has to then be translated to the right side and you will do the things that um, in the wild you will actually kind of use your fingers like a claw on their belly because that would be what a wolf would do or you claw on their back, but it's not hard. It's just so that they get desensitized to that. And then once you get done with that, and I mean, you pick up their feet, you spend maybe 10 minutes doing this, and then you go back up to their sweet spot, you scratch them on the forehead or rub them on the forehead, and then you turn and you walk off and they follow you. Now you have follow-up. And then you walk all around the round pen with them following you. Stop every once in a while, you rub them some more, you rub the sweet spot, and they will not leave you. And that is your follow-up. And then what I do with that with people that are doing some of the ho different horse programs is I will have them go into the arena where I have poles set up and, and trails set up with rails. And they have to actually ask, see if the horse will join up with them enough to follow up to go through these obstacles. Um, and then what, what kind of people are coming to you for these programs? Well, we have corporate groups that we do like team building with, and I do different programs with them. I have programs where they actually, we have a horse in the arena, I mean in the round pen, and there is a crate set up in the middle of the round pen on with a rail across it. And the object of this team of say four, five, six people <clears throat> is to get the horse over the jump. And what this is about, is they can't touch the horse. They can't, uh, you know, they have to drive the horse. And the object is to get them to think outside the box. They are given three rules, which people traditionally make up more rules than you give them. And they will often keep going. And then finally they'll say, okay, well, what about this? And what about this? I'm not going to give the way you get it done away. But it, it, everything I ask them is set up for success. Because sometimes they'll say, well, I can't do this. You gave me something we can't do. And I go, no, that's not true. I would never do that. Then the other one would be to do uh, mini horse driving in an obstacle course. Because a heavy Clydesdale or Percheron is pretty terrifying to somebody that's not around horses. And so, you know, you give them a wagon with a big Percheron on it and they go, ah. Oh. So you give them a little two-wheel cart with a tiny little horse that's about 36 inches tall. And they're like, okay, I can do this. So we do obstacle driving with the mini horses and then we do uh, the other things on the ground we also do I will get them on the horse and the key is when you get people on the horse sometimes their whole dynamic shift as far as fear it's one thing to be on the ground they may be fearful on the ground but boy they get on their back and then they can be terrified so the object there is to ask them to have a task because once they have the task their fear diminishes some because now they're focusing on oh she wants me to take this horse around the poles now what was it the left rein the right how, how did I okay look where I'm going okay got to remember that so everything that I'm coaching them with takes away from their fear and softens them and softens the horse and they remember one of the big things I try to say is please keep breathing I hate it when people turn blue and fall off their horse so because they will they'll, they'll stop breathing you'll look up and you'll just see and their whole body is rigid and I'll say you know there's a couple of things you can do to help your horse be soft you can smile because when you smile it softens your entire body you can hum or sing if you have a good voice or whistle because that also softens your body and it also means you're breathing 
So this is an effective way to get people, because most of the people I'm working with are not people that are coming to learn how to ride a horse. They just want a horse experience. And so by getting this horse experience without the fear element out, that's what really helps them is to give them tasks to do. So that's how my remedial girls, they're all girls, and I just because I like mares. Uh, so that's what their object is to do, is to get these people comfortable while they do their task. Now, Shorty, what, what do you get out of this with regard to the connection with the horses, the work that you've done with Monty Roberts, the, the heat up, the joint up, and especially your iron free horsemanship? I mean, did you ever ride with a bit or did you ever ride with shoes on their I, I never rode with shoes because I grew up where we just didn't do that. Um, we did have bits occasionally. They were usually what they call a Texas grazing bit. It's just a mild little, it's the old traditional bit that was around from the cowboy day. But there's a, there's a classic saying, and that is the mildest bit or any anything, whether it's a hackamore or a bitless bridle or a bit, a spade bit, whatever it is, it can become an instrument of torture in the wrong hands. So no matter how soft or easy it is, it can still be an a, a really an instrument of torture. So for me, um, there just was a point uh, after I became, I guess, when I was in my 20s, I went, you know what? I don't like this because we started horses with hackamores, like a, a bow cell, a leather piece that goes across the nose. We started them with that. And I went, gosh, you know, this just because I was out on my horses all day. And I thought, how, how comfortable is it for them to try to graze while I'm doing something on the fence or something with this thing in their mouth? And and then there were always these things about, oh, you have to take their teeth out for certain horses. You have to take their wolf teeth out and everything. And I went, I just can't go there. So I just quit and I went to using a hackamore and a bosal and then I gradually progressed to when Dr. Cook invented his bitless bridle and um, then the the spurs were just never in my vocabulary. I just I never needed them. I did some classical riding, but I just didn't I didn't use them. And whips are another thing that you hear people talk about and and they they use them as a cue. They'll, they'll say, "Oh, it's just an extension of my hand." And they'll tap them on the hip. Just tap them. But it's still, it is an instrument of fear for the horse, and a lot of horses have been had those misused on them, so that it brings back that memory of, oh no, I'm not, I'm not going there. And I mean, as Monty pointed out, he said, when you go to the tax stores, what do you think is one of the largest selling items in the tax store? Whips. <laughs> so. Now, can you tell us about your relationship with Monty and how that's developing and what's coming up in your life with him? Sure. Yeah, I um. Uh, there is a, a man who um, I had followed Monty from the time he wrote his first book, which was The Man Who Listens to Horses. And by the way, he says anybody can listen to horses. It's, uh, he says, it's not listening. Or he says anybody can listen to horses is to understand them. <clears throat> and so he, uh, I read that book. I read Shy Boy. And then I kind of just didn't give it much thought. And worked with various horses the way I had always done, and it was working okay. And then I, there was another man I happened to admire very much named Joe Camp, and he was the one that did all the Benji, Benji movies. And he somehow or another fell into the rabbit hole when he met up with Monty and went out to farm his flag is up farm and studied with him and the next thing you know he and his wife Kathleen who never had a horse have seven horses they've rescued mustangs and I mean he's just totally converted into this amazing advocate for iron free horses and um, so he had um, a book that I stumbled onto and I read it and I went you know, these remedial horses I'm working with, I think if I studied with Monty, it would be really helpful for them. So I went online. Uh, he had a thing called um, um, intensive horsemanship or something that I was able to go to. I went out for that and fell in love with what he did and him and what he does and all the amazing things he does for humans and for horses. Came back and signed up for another, went out there and then have actually been working toward entertaining a way that I can get certification as a Monty Roberts certified instructor. And that's kind of on the back burner right now because of my business, but it is still in my radar. And so that is how I came to be um, 
really enamored with wanting to have him come here because he is a rock star in Europe. He travels all over Europe and UK, Scotland, and everybody. He's a household word. And he hasn't done anything in the States very much in, very, in quite some time. And I don't think he's been in Arizona in about 15 years. So the last time I was there, I just said, Monty, what would it take to get you to come to Arizona? And he goes, well, I don't know. Talk to my daughter. She takes care of that. So I go over there and I go, what would it take? Two hours later, we got him coming to Arizona. So he's going to be at Arizona Equestrian Connection uh, on March the 14th. And he'll be doing his world tour, which is called From My Hands to Yours. And there's a VIP uh, demonstration that's from 6 until 7. And then the actual uh, general admission uh, demonstration is from, uh, I believe it's from 8 or 7.30 or 8. And there'll be an intermission. And then it will go until about 10.30 at night because Monty doesn't, he, he's an tireless worker for horses and people and then he will do a question and answer after that and then he will also do book signings and all that sort of thing so well you can go to our website which is arizona equestrian connection.com and if you look up in the right hand corner it says monty roberts event and if you will click on that it will take you to his page and if you uh scroll down there'll be a flyer that tells you all the details if you'll scroll down and it will show purchase tickets you click on that and you are able to purchase either the vip or the general admission tickets and then that will be done all online and you will get a verification online on, on in your email and then um, I, we can just back up a minute. And if I was someone to tell you that I lived in an area that is too hard and too rocky for my horse not to have shoes, what would you tell me? <clears throat> well, I would tell you what I had to do because my horses were living on rock and uh, they were barefoot and they were fine. And then the ranch that I now run, which is Jackpot Ranch, um, it is uh, irrigated pastures. And that's like standing around on marshmallows all day. You know, it's like it, the feet don't stay very tough very long. And after about three months, I noticed my horses were struggling when we went riding on places that they had never struggled before. So I had used uh, a boot that's called Renegade. Uh, they're made in Tucson. And I had just quit using them because I hadn't needed them because my horses, there's a key about barefoot horses. You have to live where you ride your horses have to live where you ride well if they're living on irrigated pasture that's not where i'm riding so i had to go back to boots so and these are easy to put on they're long lasting um they don't come off and i mean i ride like uh, an apache as i call it and uh so i really do like them and that's what's enabled me to keep my horses barefoot there's also a lot of other factors in maintaining a barefoot horse and one of them is diet and uh, alfalfa and corn and all these things that people supplement their horses, they're actually not doing their horse a favor because they just aren't designed to have that kind of nutrition. It's too rich for them. And it does, it does show up in their feet. And it also shows up in their level of energy, which sometimes can be over. People don't understand why their horse is so totally energetic and, and out of control. And if they change their diet to a nice grass hay, they'll find their horse settles right down to a whole different personality. It's like giving a kid a bowl of sugar and then lock him in the bathroom and see what happens. <laughs> or something that just go on while you ride and then off and absolutely the the yeah and then they're barefoot the rest of the time yeah how do you feel about someone who says that i can only have control if i have metal in their mouth well i mean the bottom line there is if that's a good fallacy and i'm glad they feel comfortable that way because if you think you have control of a horse and they want to run away they could have a steel spike in their mouth and it's not going to change it they're going to run away so it's again it's a matter of uh them learning to be comfortable and know their horse and have their horse be able to be responsive to them there again where do we go willing partners you know, you've got a willing partner. If you've got a willing partner that, you know, it's a relationship. I say that like with me, there are times I have to say to like my horse Tess, I'll go, okay, Tess, I, I'm going to leave it up to you. You got it. You get us out of this, you know, and I'm going to let her take care of me. And there's other times she's going to have to look at me and she will. And I'll go, okay, I'll get us out of this. Don't worry about it. We're good because we have a partnership. I'm not the boss and she's not the boss. We are partners and we work together. And I'm not going to make her do anything that's going to endanger her. And I don't believe she will do anything that will endanger me. That's wonderful. 
So in parting, if you had to tell conventional horse people, such as myself, prior to meeting you, what would you tell them? How would you advise them to move their relationship with their equines to something that's uh, non-violent, softer, kinder, and more of a joining up? And not, not necessarily Monty Roberts joining up, but just to kind of develop that partnership mm -hmm. versus a domination type thing. How, I, how would you tell them? I, think, I think one of the key things I remember is that, um, you know, uh, we live on a clock and uh animals live in the now and they don't have a clock and they could care less and horses don't care if you have an appointment at six o'clock and you came out at four o'clock to teach your horse something and it's now 5 45 and you've got to go and now you're going to just okay we're going to do this one way or the other so it's i call it take the time it takes so that it takes less time because if you it's so much easier to teach the horse the right thing if you take the time if you give them the wrong thing by losing your patience by being violent then you've got to unlearn them something that you've never wanted them to and that's where my remedial horses my work with remedial is so much of it is unlearning something that was the wrong thing and helping them to find the right thing and doing that through and i mean you if you have something that you have a goal then allow yourself all day be willing to commit to all day if that's what it takes and then also recognize the fact that maybe you wanted to go from a to f but the horse got you to a plus quit and say good job because when you come back the next day you'll probably make it to a little bit further, maybe a B or a B plus, and it'll keep moving in those, again, Monty, incremental learning. That's the key, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And we will do this again very soon. Okay. Um, and then hopefully we'll remind everyone how to get a hold of you and when <coughs> Monty's going to be there. Okay, it's ArizonaEquestrianConnection.com and Monty will be here on March the 14th and you can get your tickets online and uh, there's all the information there, time, everything and if there's any problem, there are phone numbers there that you can call if you can't seem to get through or there's a problem with getting your ticket online and we want to see you there. It's, it's a rare, rare opportunity. We are so excited to have him come. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Long drive. I know it was crazy. So um, once again, thank you for joining us with Holistic Tech here with Dr. O, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.